All right. Can you hear me? That's good. I was just handed a, uh, a prayer request uh, to pray for the situation in Iran. And um, I know it's heavy on our hearts. I know it's heavy, especially on some who have family there. And uh, let's, let's just pause and, and do that. Heavenly Father, I, we in some ways don't know how to pray. I'm reminded in your word how many different times you worked in ways that we cannot fathom, that people couldn't have imagined, even in that part of the world, how you used Persian kings, a guy named Darius and a guy named Cyrus, for your purposes. And we think about the, the terrible stuff that is happening right now in Iran and the, the lives that are being taken, the, the fear that is being put on so many. And Father, we would just pray that you would be at work. We pray for your peace to reign. We pray, Father, that you would be at work in that place. We pray, Father, that your will would be done. And Lord, as we pray that, we pray for the families in our church who this touches and is especially close to. Because they have family there. They have, they have friends who live in that place right now and who are dealing with the consequences of, of everything that's going on. Father, would you surround them with your presence? Would you be with their families? Would you, would you protect them and keep them? Lord, I think about the conversation that I had with Ellie just a few, few weeks ago about how her family was being threatened and how she was being threatened through them. And Father, I pray that you would wrap your arms of love and protection around her and her family, that you keep them. Lord, we, we bring this whole mess, this whole situation to you, and we ask for you to do what we cannot do, to be at work in that place. And we pray that in the days ahead, we will look back and see that the hand of God has been at work in Iran. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, a moment ago, we read, we heard read for us by uh, Sandrine in French and, and then Violet in English, these wonderful words that, that I don't know about you, but we can kind of picture, can't we? of Jesus with these little children on his lap and placing his hands upon them. I mean, they, they, these words certainly speak to what we have kind of witnessed this morning, don't they? About, uh, as, as we watch Tim and Amanda bring their, their youngest child to be dedicated to the Lord. And maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, well played, Pastor. That was a perfect passage of Scripture for you to read. You know, and there, there's, I mean, what, what other passage of scripture would fit in this moment? But I, I really think that this has more to say to us than might be our first inclination of what we think this is saying. You see, I believe these words speak powerfully to us about the kingdom, the kingdom of God. We're told, aren't we, in this passage that people were bringing their littlest ones, to Jesus, for him to place his hands on them. They wanted Jesus to bless them. And just a few moments ago, we, we prayed blessings on Ezra and on their family and on their home. 
And I envision in our story that the parents are wanting Jesus to do the same thing. They want him to touch their children. And, and I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking, well, who wouldn't? I mean, if Jesus were here, would you not want him to, to place his hands on you, on your children? But the craziest thing about this story is that the disciples of Jesus are seeking to prevent this from happening. I mean, you did catch that, right? I mean, stop and think about that for a moment. The disciples of Jesus are wanting to keep children away from Jesus. I mean, can you imagine something so ridiculous? We're told, in fact, that they rebuked these parents. They, they didn't just say, you know, I, could, could, could you come back at a different time? This, this, this doesn't work right now. No, it says that they rebuked these parents. And the obvious question, at least in my mind, is why in the world would they rebuke these parents? Why would, why would they rebuke these parents from bringing their children to Jesus? I mean, it seems, doesn't it, callous, unkind? I, I would even say unchristian. Would you, would you agree? I, I got thinking about this and thought about how, how sometimes in the church we're prone to do the same thing. Not necessarily with children, granted, but like the disciples, we, we often sometimes in the church act like gatekeepers, seeking to guard our doors, our resources, our time. We don't want to waste it on, well, well, you know, you fill in the blank. Oh, over the last uh, two or three weeks, we've been looking at who we are called to be as a people that we are called to be a people who are striving to be a people of presence, a people of grace, a people of hospitality. And one of the things that, that I truly hope that you've recognized as we've made this journey through, this, through these, these three images, through these three ideas, is how often we find Jesus in places that we don't expect to find him, among people that we might assume would be on the outside looking in but he brings them in. He goes to them. And that is certainly a true about that final aspect of hospitality. We use the image of a door as we talked about hospitality. Doors are supposed to be, aren't they? They're supposed to be the ways that we go out and the ways that we come in. And yet so often, it seems that more often than not, that we, we find ourselves on guard at doors. <laughs> we see them as, as, as where we, we stop people from coming in. We stop people from going out. We block the way. That leads me to think about the word hospitality that we tied to this idea of doors. Hospitality is an interesting word. We we think we know what, what we think we know what it means, but but do you realize that, that in the Greek that the word in Greek is a compound word? It's, it's made of two words. The two words, love, stranger. Hospitality is love for the stranger. It's a call to welcome the outsider, to enter into the world of the, of the stranger. It's, it's a call to live with open doors, doors through which we, we welcome all and through the, the same doors that we, we exit and, and be with all, that we enter into our world. And that, as I think about it, certainly doesn't seem to be what is happening in our text. Instead, we find the disciples rebuking those who are bringing those little children to Jesus. And again, you ask, why? Maybe the disciples that Jesus has selected were just not good with kids. Maybe that was it, right? Maybe they just don't like children. Maybe that's what it was 
and most other, you know, everybody else, we, we like, we like kids, but, but those particular 12 guys just, just didn't like children. They didn't like those snotty noses, those, you know, dirty diapers. They just didn't like to have kids around. Well, I, I don't think that was probably it. I, I really think the reason that the disciples sought to keep those kids away from Jesus is because they didn't see any value any potential upside of Jesus taking time out of his busy schedule to bless them. I'd remind you, in that culture, children were not valued at all. They were seen as the least. I mean, there was a sense in which it was like, why bother with them? There were certainly more important people to, to you know, kind of pander to. And we see that in the next story that we heard read earlier on about this rich man who comes to Jesus. We don't see the disciples there saying, no, 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 I'm sorry, he's too busy. He's, he's taking time with some kids. No, he is welcomed with open arms. And I, I find myself wondering if sometimes we do the same. Do we only give time to those people that we see with potential? I'm reminded of the, of the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4. It's, it's this wonderful story in Mark chapter 4 with this farmer goes out into these fields and sows this recklessly. I mean, you start sowing seeds here, sowing seeds there. It's just, I mean, it's a mess. I mean, there's seeds on the path. There's seeds in this rocky soil. There's seeds, you know, among the thorns. There's seeds, just seed is everywhere. But some does land on the good soil too. I mean, it seems, as you look at that parable, it's like, well, he's kind of wasting the seed. He needs to make sure that he's putting it in the right place, for crying out loud. And yet nowhere is this farmer rebuked for his careless sowing. You might say, in, re in retrospect, that he's encouraged, because in the end, he's praised for this incredible harvest that comes. And you get a sense in this story that the goal is not not for us to micromanage the process, making sure that we only sow in the right places. The goal is to sow, to sow, to sow with reckless abandon and to leave the harvest to him. It's a, a, a call for us to recklessly love, to recklessly give, to be Christ. And I think it's clear the disciples think, think for Jesus to take time with these children is to waste his time. That's what they're thinking. He should, he should give himself to projects and to people who are worth his time. That he's got more important things to do. Of course, one of the wonderful things about this story is we discover that Jesus will have nothing of this. And not just in this story, all through the gospel, we see the reality of that. In our story, though, we're told that he becomes, the word that's used is indignant. It's not a mild word. It's not a soft word, is it? It's a strong word. I mean, Jesus isn't disappointed with his disciples. He's not sad that they are thinking this way. He is indignant. He's upset. He's angry. One commentator I read said that he, he, Jesus finds their attitude, their response, repugnant. I don't think that's good, is it? <laughs> and while the disciples are seeking to be Jesus' gatekeepers, keeping these bothersome nobodies from intruding on Jesus and his schedule and his valuable time, it's clear that Jesus has a very, very different view. It's also clear that he understands the motivation behind the disciples' actions, that they think that those kids aren't worth his time. And that's where Jesus says these words. He says, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now, I think we have heard these words, even if we're not in the church, we've heard these words before. 
and 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 they just kind of wash over us and we think oh is that wonderful that's just that's just beautiful sentiment that's just a beautiful phrase but you know what this would have been like to those disciples it would have been like a slap across the face the kingdom of god belongs to what to these are you kidding jesus and it's it's not very much earlier that he had already slapped them once in, in the passage that we heard read earlier. In the first reading where Jesus says how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God, because in their view, wealth was a sign of God's blessing. They were certainly slapped across the face there. They thought that they had it all figured out. They thought they understood who was in and who was out. They thought they understood who was included and who was excluded. And Jesus is suggesting otherwise. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It belongs to those who have nothing to offer. The empty-handed, those who, who trust in no, in no one but him. And that brings me to this, this crucial line in this story. The, the words of Jesus that we cannot afford to miss this morning. Jesus says, truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. That's a, that's a strong statement, isn't it? And did you notice that Jesus doesn't just make the statement, that he prefaces it with this emphatic statement, this call to listen. I mean, really listen. He says, truly, I tell you. It, it, it would be kind of like saying, guys, listen up. Pay attention. He says, the only way to enter the kingdom is to enter as a child. Maybe you're thinking, well, how do we do that? What is Jesus suggesting here? What is he suggesting to us, to, to me? I mean, how does a child enter the kingdom? I mean, children are, are totally dependent. Even in the picture that is drawn for us in the story, these children don't come of their own volition, aren't, do they? They are brought by their parents. They trust in their care. But they also, do you notice that they come empty-handed? They, they don't have any resources, no, no wealth with which to impress. Maybe the best way to understand what, what Jesus is saying is from the context of these words, because the story that we heard read earlier is the story that immediately follows these words of Jesus, where a rich ruler who, who, who despite his unflawed devotion to God and his great possessions, is unable to secure the kingdom. He, he, you see, he can't divest himself of his wealth, his position. He, you might say, refuses to become like a little child, simply receiving the, God, the gift that God has for him. Instead, he chooses to trust in his wealth, in his own strength, in his own security instead of Christ. He, he refuses to receive, he, receive the kingdom because he thinks he can somehow possess it by force. But the only way that we can enter the kingdom of God is if we receive it as a gift, because that is what it is. Maybe the call to receive the kingdom of God as a little child is a call for us to recognize that we have nothing to bring, that we simply come to him. I mean, this, this story really does provide us with a, a beautiful picture but it also provides us with a great opportunity and a wonderful challenge to receive the kingdom as a child. We don't have to have the answers. We don't have to understand. We don't have to grasp it all. We come empty-handed, humbly, remembering that our hope is found not in ourselves or in our resources, but in him, in Jesus. 
as I close, I, I want to briefly move back to the story of that rich young man. He, he comes to Jesus, doesn't he? And he's asking, in essence, for what Jesus had just been talking about. He wants the kingdom. He, he's tried everything he knows to get it himself. He's tried to live the right way, to do the right thing. But he recognizes in his question, we see it, that something's missing. And unfortunately, our, our rich, self-satisfied friend has his hands so full of his own accomplishments and his own wealth that he can't receive what Jesus longs to give. Because how can you receive something when your hands are full? And he's unwilling to, to relinquish those things, to let those things go, trusting in Christ alone. He's unwilling to lay down what he had and simply to cling to Jesus. And I find myself wondering this morning, what are you clinging to? In whom do you trust? That's a hard question. Tim is going to come and lead us in a, in a closing song. But my prayer is that this song will be more than just a closing song. My prayer is that this song would become a prayer for us, a prayer that we might pray, an, invita an invitation for, for Jesus to come and to take our lives, a declaration of our trust in him. The kingdom of God belongs to such as these. It belongs to we who come, not because we have the answers, but because we place our trust in him. Will you do that this morning?